Let's get started. Now, Brexit, um, since June 23rd, that's been a little over three months ago, since the Britons uh, decided to leave the European Union in a referendum, there has been a lot of talks and concerns and maybe just quelling fears. Uh, we have in the studio with me two professors who will discuss the Brexit and its consequences. I have here with me Andrew Spicer, uh, professor at Cass Business School. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. And further on to the right is uh, Gabrielle Leon, a lecturer at King's College in the City of London. Am I correct? Yes. Yes. All right. Well, thank you. Um, so I'm going to give you a common question, um, and either one of you can answer, mm -hmm. and both of you can answer to my question. Now, since uh, the Brexit vote, what have we been seeing? What kind of political and economic consequences have we been seeing in the United Kingdom? In some ways, the consequences of Brexit so far are extremely uncertain. So many people have said, well, nothing has happened. So the markets, uh, cra so the markets crashed, the pound uh, devalued, I think it was around about 10% um, on the day, and it was many people woke up and felt that the British economy was heading into a, an abyss. Now, what's happened subsequently is that many of the markets have kind of um, gone back up. Uh, you could almost feel like nothing has really happened. And in some ways, nothing has happened. That's the point. We haven't actually seen the consequences of what uh, Brexit is going to be. And there's a lot of uncertainty about when Article 50, which is when Brexit is going to be tri triggered, will happen. So it's quite easy to kind of act as if you know, nothing's happened. But the thing is that Brexit still hasn't happened. And we haven't seen the consequences, uh, apart from a sort of devalued pound, on, on the British economy. Right. In fact, I, I think I saw in the papers this morning that um, some are arguing that the UK economy is actually stronger now than ever. And, um, you know, the, there's been growth, retail numbers are up, consumer sentiment is up. So maybe it was just a really a concern more than anything? Yeah, many people say that the, the business community, like 80% of the, the kind of mainstream business community was, uh, came out against Brexit. Um, and many people felt that those fears were very much false. Uh, then the problem is that they're then saying, well, were they kind of crying wolf, something which hasn't happened. But the point I'm trying to make is that many of the actual consequences of Britain, so if you look behind us, we see the city of London, mm -hmm. it's like an aircraft carrier off the coast of Europe and it relies for its business on what's called passporting, which means that it can trade its financial, uh, it can trade its, uh, financial services into Europe. If that disappears, which is uncertain about whether that's going to happen or not, then uh, this huge wealth generating uh, business behind me uh, much of it, or some of it at least, will disappear. The thing is that we're uncertain about that. I guess, for, but if we then turn from that sort of big structural issue to the consumer economy, mm -hmm. which is things like house prices, are people still buying their uh, Samsung iPhones and mm -hmm. uh, Samsung phones and so on, then we find that, you know, the, the, that, that um, that's not really had an effect. And in some ways, actually, the cheaper pound has had actually a benefit of it. So it's, uh, easy to buy. Um, the UK is more attract its goods are more attractive overseas. Right, so Samsung Galaxy phones. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> All right, um, what about uh, Dr. Leona? Would you tell us about the political consequences that we have been seeing or are we seeing? Yes, I mean, I, I, I think we've seen considerable political consequences. The Cameron government ended the day after the vote. He was replaced by Theresa May, who is from the same party, but she's a very different type of conservative. And I think the types of policies she's been proposing already show that, you know, her plans are very different. If anything, I think the reason we haven't seen even more consequences is that the Labour Party, which is the main opposition in this country, is in complete disarray to the extent that they're not even really discussing Brexit in the uh, conference which is taking place at the moment. But yes, I, I mean, I, I think we have seen some important consequences and the consequences will grow as time goes on. So those are things that we need to uh, keep an eye on, a watchful eye on. Um, let's move over to trade front. Um, breaking off from the EU for the UK means that it breaks away from the trade relations that it had with, um, with along with the European Union. And now uh, there are concerns that it needs to renegotiate its trade deals. For instance, South Korea is one where the two countries may have to renegotiate a trade deal. Um, what, do you, what do you guys think about that? Um, will the UK be able to 
create another very powerful trade deals uh, that will not negatively impact the trade on the trade front um, from here on forth. The difficulty is that um, the UK is stepping out of one of the largest trading blocks in the world, uh, the, um, the European Union. Now, the European Union uh, has deals already in place with, for instance, Korea and many other countries, which have been hard negotiated. Now the UK is in a position where it needs to renegotiate trade deals. Um, at the time when Brexit happened, you had many Brexiteers, which are the people who are in favour of Brexit, mm -hmm. um, saying, oh, we can go back to our former colonies and they love us there and they can kind of, we can negotiate trade deals with India and so forth. Somehow I think that that shows a rather naive perspective on what's happened in uh, colonial uh, Britain. But nonetheless, the point is that um, there was a hope that these trade deals could be easily negotiated. What there didn't seem to be a lot of thinking about is trade deals can take uh, years if not decades to actually negotiate. Mm -hmm. From what I understand Korea is actually a very uh, effective and very efficient trade negotiator sure. so it's a deal with the uh, is, I think it was with the US was done within 14 months or something like this it was a very quick deal whereas most deals can take a very long time so that's the first point they take a long time the second point is that most countries already have a long queue of people who are looking to do deals with them and there's a question about whether the UK can kind of walk to the front of the mm -hmm. queue and do the deal. The third big problem is that basically there are very, there's very, very little in the way of actual expertise in doing trade deals in the UK. Most of that expertise has gone to Europe um, and the UK government is currently scrambling around and trying to find the lawyers, the negotiators, all of those people you actually need to do a large complex trade deal. And as you know that things like tariffs are not the big issue. It's often the non-tariff issues right, right. which are the serious issues. Mm -hmm. So so at the moment I think uh, the UK finds itself in a place where there's been a lot of positive talk in the few days after Brexit. You know, people are queuing up at the UK's door to do a trade deal. Sure, there's interest in doing it, but the process and the time which that will take I think has um, been underestimated. Well, it seems like um, everything is uncertain at this moment and we would have to wait and see what develops, how it develops on this front. Um, and last but not least, I'd like to know your projections of the UK economy mid to longer term. Gabrielle, why don't you um, just share with us your insights on projections for the UK economy mid to longer term? Well, I mean, I, th I think the UK economy in the end will be okay. Um, I think a lot of it depends on what kind of agreement uh, is, is reached with the European Union. Um, so, so, and I, but, but that's sort of the short-term concern in, in the sense that there will be a lot of instability. Uh, longer term, I, I think there will be trade deals that will be negotiated and, you know, the UK economy will be okay. I think the big question is whether the UK economy will be better than it would have been if it had remained in the EU. Uh, I think the answer to that question depends on what you think will happen in the EU. And that's unclear at the moment. So all remains unclear at the moment. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's for the British people and the rest of the world to really try to, I suppose, minimize the negative impact and uh, make the best out of the situation. Yeah, I think that the issue is that the, the UK now is currently in a process of building up expertise mm -hmm. around how do you operate as an international power. I think Korea actually has interesting lessons to teach the UK in some ways. So if you look at Korea and the UK, there are two uh, countries which are around about the same size in land mass, same size in population, around about. Comparable, um, yeah. Comparable, comparable. Um, and uh, they're both maritime nations. Uh, they're both based around the mega city, you know, Seoul and London. Sure. Um, so, so I think there are similarities and also Korea is uh, surrounded by larger, you know, powerful neighbours, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess the question we should be asking is what could we actually learn from, from Korea? And you've been able to build up some high-tech industries. One of the questions currently the UK faces is that if one of our major economic powerhouses disappears or gets cut back, which is financial services in the city of London, how do we build up our offerings around technology? So where we're based at Cass Business School mm -hmm. sits right between one of the two, two, sort of one of the big economies, which is the financial services sector, 
sector and one of the growth economies which is so-called silicon roundabout where you have lots of high-tech right. emerging companies so I think that we could learn a lot from how you've been able to build up uh, Korea's been able to build up uh, high-tech companies to be world beaters sure and we have been seeing more cooperative projects on those fronts between the two countries so we'll have to wait and see how that develops all right um, would like to speak to you more but because of time restrictions I have to let you go now it was lovely talking to you both I thank you gentlemen for coming to our set today thank you thank you very much